Okay, so today we are going to make a definitive guide to buying E36s and E46s. I'm not going to go into E90. I don't claim to be a know-it-all for those chassis, but I've got the 36 and 46 down for the past like 20 years. I'm That's old. Awesome. Yeah, you are. <laughs> and I've probably, and this is not, uh, people would say humble brag. This is actually like a terrifying yikes, yikes, yikes. thing. I Big probably yeah, Big ick. Big ick. I've, <laughs> I've probably owned a hundred, or together, we've probably owned a hundred E36s slash 46s. Over the years. Yeah, slash Z3s slash. I'm not saying that. 30 of them weren't cars that we had for 10 minutes and stripped them down and sent them to the junkyard. Yeah. There was a couple of those <laughs> back when they were like a dollar. When they were so cheap that like, you're like, oh, I need the front subframe out of a car. I bought a crashed one. You take the sub front, front subframe out and you put it aside for what you need. And then you're like, ah, maybe I'll save the gearbox, diff, axles, throw all the rest of it away. And I would do this thing where I'd post on Instagram. You probably remember. Mm -hmm. And I would be like, I'm going to be in this parking lot with this car. Anything you need off of it, I'll, it'll be there for two hours. And I would just go grab lunch while people pulled and ripped parts off of it while it was on the way to the junkyard. Because I felt so bad that I was like throwing out these parts. And this was back when like these parts were almost free anyway. Yeah, you, you almost couldn't give them away. Right. So anyways, just giving you a background of E36s and E46s so you can decide whether you want to believe what I'm telling you in this video or not. Um, I've been drifting them forever, forever. I think my first one was 2004 or five. so it really is almost 20 years. Um, so we'll dive right into it. I have Chelsea, my wife, with me. She is going to also probably banter some and talk a bunch of shit, <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> She also knows a lot about these, and she'll kind of fill in the cracks of where I'm maybe not knowing at all, or maybe she has a story or whatever. I figured she'd be fun to have on this, because she's been part of this E3646 journey. Okay, so we're going to start with E36, and then we're going to go to E46, and then we're going to compare the two back to back. Um, and we're not going to really talk about the looks of them, because it's more about the drifting and the actual style uh, and how they drive more than what they look like. For some. For some. For some. She's shallow. <laughs> I I don't mind E46s, but an E36 is way easier to make it look better. Well, it already looks better from the get-go. <laughs> I mean, like, coupe, sedan, wagon, all of them in E36s. TI. TI. Oh, yeah, the TI definitely looks better <laughs> in an E36. <laughs> but... I feel like they just look more classic, more boxy, and it's easy to have a stock-looking one drift and look better than an E46. But I don't want to harp too much on the actual looks of them. Okay, so if you're going to buy one of these for drifting, and this whole video is about buying these cars to go drifting, um, you don't want to buy a 318, 323, or 325 E36. And I know a lot of you watching maybe already have one of those. And I'm not saying you should sell it and buy a 328 or an M3, but you should probably do that if you haven't built it yet. <laughs> <laughs> Reason being, for many reasons, okay? If you have like a winter beater or it's, you know, only rains where you live or it snows or whatever, 318, 323, 325, those will work. But if you're drifting and you're going to be drifting all the time and you plan on becoming someone who drifts like as a hobby, not just every once in a while for fun, I'm going to go thrash this around. Um, the 318, 323, and 325 have really weak drivetrains. So the power is okay on the 325 and 323, but the 318 is brutal. Um, it's really not enough power for most American drifting. I know, again, there's lots of people overseas in places that drift on like retreads, and, and that's the style of drifting it is. Those cars will work. But the biggest problem is the drivetrain. The diff in the 318 is small case, so it's, it breaks much easier. It's 168 mil instead of 188 mil. And like you have to swap them out pretty much immediately if you start making power, if you start running tires that have grip, if you start having um, 
start driving hard, hand braking, hucking it in, you're going to end up breaking the diffs. So the 323 and the 325 come with a bigger diff. Also, by the way, if you're not taking notes on this, you probably want to take notes on this because I'm about to melt your brain with way too much information. Um, so basically, 318, 323, 325. 318 is a four-cylinder, small case differential, really weak gearbox. Um, 323 and 325 are both 2.5 liters. Um, 323 is a basically a detuned 325. Again, they come with weak gearboxes. They come with weak axles. And both of those things together cost a lot of money to upgrade. And that's kind of the reason why I say you shouldn't buy a 318, 323, 325. The power in the 325, like I said, is okay. Um, they make about 160-ish wheel stock. Um, and that's at the wheel, not at the crank. I don't know what they make at the crank. Um, a 323 makes about 100 horsepower less, or 10 horsepower less than that. And the 318 actually makes only a little bit less than that, even though it's four cylinder and 1.8 or 1.9 liter, but it makes no torque in the mid range. It's really peaky. Now, like I said, if it snows where you live and you just want a car to kick around in and have fun where there's low grip options, those are also great cars. And they are a little bit cheaper, but they're not cheap enough to not just go buy a 328 or M3. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. So jumping into 328, after you think about the costs of upgrading, the 328 already comes with the same gearbox as the M3. It comes with a little beefier axles, strong enough axles. Um, it comes with the, the bigger diff, which is the 188 mil. It makes a lot more mid-range torque and a little bit more power. So it makes like about 20 horsepower of the tire more than a 325, but the mid-range is a lot better in that motor. It's also one of the stronger motors out of all the M50 uh, and M52 variants. M50 being 325. Um, so the gearbox is basically indestructible on any sort of power you're going to put down at all. Um, this is the F320 or 310. Um, most of the 328s are, are 320s. And they're like 600 horsepower, no problem holding, as long as you have a proper clutch and you know how to drive them. But in stock form, you're basically never going to break them. Um, the M3 on top of the 328 has even stronger axles, same gearbox, and a lot more power. So a 328 might make 170 or 180 wheel horsepower. The M3s typically make 210 wheel horsepower right out of the box. So it's a lot more power um, and a lot stronger rear axles and stub shafts. But they come at a much higher cost because they're M3s. So talking about cost between all these, 323, 325 are typically around the same price. You can buy one that's clapped out, like drift car, you know, whatever, for between 2,500 and four grand, right? Yeah. And you can also find 328s for like 3,500 to five grand. So for like $1,000 more to get in a 328, you're looking at, you know, the ZF gearbox, the better diff, the bigger brakes, the easier updatable ECU because it's OBD2, like a lot of things that add up. And the gearbox, the ZFs alone are a thousand bucks now. What was your max on that price for the 328? Like five grand for one that you'd build a drift car out of. Okay. There are $10,000 328s and more, but I'm talking about if you go on Marketplace at any moment, you could buy a 328 for like. I mean, you probably look as much as I do. You can buy a 328 for four to five grand all day. Yeah. You know, and a 325 might cost you three to four grand. Yeah, they're just not going to be great looking, but that's fine. Pretty but that, yeah, they're going to be all one color. Yeah. And like, if you have a longer time to search, you'll find a nicer one for the price. I mean, everybody kind of searches marketplace, scrolls through the late night hype. People also won't drive more than like two hours to go get a car though. So yeah. you're looking at a very takes time, small then. spot. Yeah, it takes time. Yeah. We have bought plenty of them for $1,000 running driving did a burnout in the guy's driveway leaving. <laughs> I've gone to buy them and they're like, I don't know what's wrong with it. It's broken. And I go and fix it in their driveway in 20 seconds and then rip shitties in the driveway and leave. Not in their driveway. Not in actually. their driveway. Maybe the cul-de-sac. That's like a thing. Even Brent's been with us when we go and buy a car. Just test drive it, take it, He's rip some donuts seat. in it. <laughs> and then... 
and then pull up, dude. Yeah. I'll take it. You got to make sure the diff's good. You got to make sure there's no drivetrain banging around doing all that. If it'll do a burnout, it'll, it'll make it home. That's, the, I mean. No. At least it'll <laughs> make it home before the burnout. After it, maybe not. Yeah, so just that's just based off the drivetrain and the horsepower and the simplicity of it. Um, I think it's easier to find parts for the M52 motor as well. Um, the three, the, the 328 motor, the 325 motor, especially if you buy a non Venos motor, they have no torque down low, no power. And it's really hard to actually find parts and ECUs and sensors for some of those motors. The newer 328, you can find a lot more. Um, but yeah, so <clears throat> 328 M3, more power, better gearbox, better axles. Um, more better. the tunability is better cause they're OBD2. Um, and stub shafts. There was also, this is complicated, but there was also 3 liter M3 only in 95. That would have been OBD1. But those motors are still pretty good. But they're the least reliable engine out of any of the E36 engines, the S50, which is a 3 liter M3. They're great. They work awesome. I actually really like how they drive, but they have valve train problems because they had two piece valves. They have. Um, that, uh... Nut that always comes off in the oil. The oil pan, the oil pump nut. There you go. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. See, that's why I have you here. <laughs> Any of these motors, once you go over 2.8 liters, they have oil pump problems because of harmonics. And when I say problems, it's not very common. I'm not going to make it this huge thing. Like, I have plenty of cars that I don't have the oil pump fixed. Um, and basically, what you do is you either safety wire it, which is definitely the better option, which is that you can just buy a nut from VAC or uh, Achilles or any of these aftermarket uh, companies that sell parts for E36. And then you just basically drop the pan and wire the nut so the nut can't come loose because the harmonic in the crank on the 3.0 and the 3.2 will rattle that nut off. And I don't even do it until the nut comes off. Yeah. <laughs> but that's because I know, and there's a little oil light when you turn your key on. So if you key on and don't start, it lights up red. And then when you start it, it'll shut off as soon as it builds oil pressure. So whenever I'm beating on my car and having fun, I just occasionally keep looking to see if it lights up. Because if it lights up, it means I have zero oil pressure. I'm calling an Uber to go home and get my truck and trailer. I'm going to pick it up, and I'm dropping the subframe and changing the nut. But... Obviously, if you have your car up in stands, you're going to replace something or do anything in there. You should just do it, especially on the 3.0 and the 3.2. The 2.8 is not so much. The crank is a lot more balanced. So 3.18 Ti, they are really expensive to drift, to build, mainly because they are way more rare than even the M3 E36. They made the least amount of compacts. So fenders, hood, bumper, front bumper, um, those are all the same as sedan, so that's easy. But the doors, hatch, rear bumper, you'll find sometimes you can get them for nothing because people think they're useless. But most of the time, it's even more money at this point because they're really hard to find. A lot of them are junked. Actually, they're getting cheaper again. The parts or the cars? The cars. Oh. They're still rare to find yeah. parts for. Like We've had problems with my TI where I need a door and a hatch, and it's just better to buy a whole car. Like, cause you can buy a whole car for like 700 bucks mm -hmm. and then get the door and the hatch and some other things and then sell the motor for 700 bucks or with a trans maybe. But either way, the reason why the 318 Ti is harder to build is a, like I said, it doesn't have as much power. It still has the 1.8 or 1.9 liter small engine in Europe and overseas. They got a 323 engine, um, in those cars, but we never got them in the States, um, which would be much more uh, beneficial to use. But the issue is the diff and axles in a stock 318 are really weak. So the minute you buy one and put any power to it outside of the 318 power, they're gonna have problems. The axles are like paper mache and the diff is a small case diff. The nice thing is you can swap all E30 stuff right underneath, and the six-cylinder E30 stuff is about as strong as 328 um, E36. So I've been running that stuff in my TI with 350 horsepower for a pretty long time. I've had some axle failures, um, but overall they do last pretty long, and I'm hooking the car up a lot and putting a lot of grip in it. The other problem is, again, with the 318 engine, is you pretty much have to swap it immediately. <clears throat> I'm not saying that, yeah, I'm not saying that you can't drift a 318. I'm not saying it's not possible, but the thing is if you're going to start driving tracks and go places and want to grow, like I was explaining about making it a hobby, 
financially, the best decision is to probably avoid the 318 unless you plan on doing the whole drivetrain swap. Because even my TI is S54 with a ZF and the E30 rear subframe with the six cylinder axles and diff. So like right off the bat, when you buy that car, if you want it to last and be able to go to an event far away and not be worried about it breaking, you're gonna be upgrading a thousand dollar gearbox, a couple hundred bucks for a drive shaft, and probably seven to eight hundred for an E30 rear diff setup and axles if you can find one for a good price. And then that's not even counting swapping whatever engine you're gonna put in there. So it's a lot more work um, versus like just buying a 328 or a M3 at that point. So interchangeability, all of the transmissions and stub shafts and axles and everything basically cross-referenced between all the cars. The only thing that will be different is when you go to M3 stuff, the stub shafts are larger on the M3 uh, differential and the actual trailing arm hub and assembly is different on the M3. So if you're gonna run M3 ones, you're, if you're gonna switch to M3 axles and you don't already have an M3, then you basically wanna be able to get M3 trailing arms at the same time. The good news is the axles get jammed inside of the trailing arm so often that you can usually buy them all together in one piece. We are not including 318 in this. Oh, not, unless not 318. Unless it's not a TI. Well, we're going to get to TIs in a second. But this is just 318 yeah, sedans just, just are good? Yeah, just six-cylinder. Yeah. Just six-cylinder ones. Also, sedan and coupe and basically... All, well, sedan and coupe are basically identically the same drivetrain-wise. The only thing different is the doors, fenders, trunk, hood. Is the drive shaft the same? The drive shaft's mm -hmm. the same. Yeah. So mechanically, they're the same. They just have different body parts. Um, okay, so then moving forward, there's also some different, differential things about the differential. Perfect. Ah. Differenting differentials. Hmm. Um, there's hollow axles and solid axles. Um, they're both really strong in the M3, but the hollow ones are actually more are actually stronger um, and lighter. So if you're building the perfect one, that's the way you want to go with that. Um, the brakes are bigger on the M3s. Obviously, the engine is bigger. They have the 3 and 3 2 liter. Um, the body has all the M3 stuff, which probably half the 325s and 328s have M3 bumpers At on this point, yeah. <laughs> by now. Um, they all had options to have limited slips. So if you wanted to have a limited slip, um, they have them. Um, basically, at this point, since they're so old, there could be anything. But whenever they had heated seats and a winter package, they always had a limited slip. So if it has heated seats and no one has messed with it, then it probably has a limited slip. It doesn't mean that if it has doesn't have heated seats that it wouldn't still have one because you could option check it. But while you're looking, if you see the heated seat thing, that might be one you want to look at more if you're trying to find an LSD. Um, so you have a limited slip. There's many different gear ratios for E36. They have 279, 291, 315, 323, 338. I'm going to cheat. 391, and I think there's a 4-1 or 4-4 floating around. Really, really small, um, tall ratio. So basically, as you get higher up in the ratio, so shorter gear, the ring and pinion gets smaller, so there's less meat on it. So if you're making lots and lots of power, going higher than a 391, sometimes it's really weak and they can break. But lots of different diff, diff ratios in the correct housing that can literally just pop right in the car and be done. Um, some of the things you have to do with an E36, 328, or M3, because you're probably not buying a 325 or 323. Definitely not a 318. Because that's why we just talked about all this. <laughs> um, you have to do R-tabs, which are the rear trailing arm bushings. Um, I always just say go spherical with them if you're drifting it. The poly ones have shitty deflection and get in the way of things and they bind up. Um, you can also, if it's a street car and you just want to beef it up some, what I do on my street cars is I just get R-tab limiters. They slide in each side of the trailing arm bucket and that basically stiffens up the factory rubber one, which allows you to have no more like NVH or like rattling or noise um, without, without losing that toe and, and having the deflection that's so crazy with the R-tabs. But the stock ones are useless you can have like an inch or so more of toe change and the wheel will actually move like forward and back 
as you're driving, it's not good. So you need R tabs, F cabs, which are front control arm bushings. Those are trash. Put some Delrin poly or solid adjustable ones in there. Um, on all E36 and E46, there's a banjo bolt in the power steering um, that you need to drill the ball out of. So there's a little ball inside of it, a check ball. As soon as you get one of those cars and you're going to start drifting it, pull that bolt out, drain the power steering fluid so you can flush it, drill the ball out, take the spring out of it. There's lots of videos online about it. And that will basically save you from blowing all your power steering stuff up. That check valve can't handle drifting, and it'll basically tear up all your steering stuff. Um, and then obviously moving forward, oh, clutch fan too. Do not remove your clutch fan. Leave your clutch fan. If it's damaged, get a new one. You can buy a European one from the diesels. They have a ring that go all the way around them. That's the one we put on all of our cars. And that doesn't break as easy. Add some strength to it. Nothing cools better than the clutch fan. So that's what I always run. That's what We've I tell everybody tried everything. Run. Yeah. I've even like, because it does rob horsepower, and there's no denying it. On an on a M3, it'll rob like almost 25, 20 horsepower at redline, like at 7,200. Um, so I've ran electric fans during the winter because then the car won't overheat. And then as soon as I go to like my first hot event, I just take the E-fan off and put the clutch fan on because it's like... It, you can't hot lap them with an electric fan. Outside of those simple necessities, obviously the cooling system on all BMWs is a disaster. Um, and it's not because it's poorly made or anything. It's just because most people are buying E36s now that are 25 years old and all the plastic's hard and brittle and they've probably overheated it at some point in its life. And you just gotta put new stuff on there. And when you put new stuff on there, then you're good for a really long time again after that. It's just the initial... Like when you're buying one, you might want to be looking for, hey, one that the whole cooling system has been redone. Um, the stock cooling system actually is really, really good. It's just people want to upgrade it when they, when they move on. And sometimes the aluminum radiators and the water pumps and all that stuff, they're all not as good as what just a nice OEM one would be. But yeah, past the simple things, obviously angle. There's many different angle kits. I'm a big proponent of SLR because I think it's simple. It's very strong and uh, it's very reasonable priced. Also the steering feel and how it drives to me is the best feeling, uh, especially for people that are getting into drifting. Um, obviously there's WiseFab, FDF, and a lot of other brands. I'm not gonna talk any shit about them. They all do what they need to do. They just have different styles of doing everything. Um, and I'm a firm believer in some of the jacking and things that SLR has to offer and having a still having a steel knuckle that is factory in case you get into a wreck or accident or anything, it's easy to find those uprights instead of a custom fabricated one. So also like if you're buying shocks for them, make sure you buy good shocks, not Max PP Pod Rods, <laughs> whatever else brands there are. Um, it's probably better off that you leave the stock stuff than yeah. upgrade all that. I mean, if they're blown and stuff, just upgrade to nice shocks again. Yeah, for real. Like, there's lots of sh crappy shocks out there that are not ideal that actually make your car harder to drift um, than just having nice shocks involved. So I always, like I said, I always run BC stuff, but there's there's other brands out there that you can buy as well. Um, the BC stuff just fits really well, and you can get it custom for exactly what you want. Okay, so simple E36, easy like like situation you'd get yourself into, that would be bad. We go by a 95 325 E36 because it's super nice, it runs and drives, and has AC, and it like fits the bill, but ah, it's a 325. Chelsea told me not to buy a 325. And it's $1,500 though, like why would I not buy it? It's so cheap. Nah, bro, it's not cheap. Because $1,500 for the car, $1,000 for a gearbox. Here, you're going to do the math for me. It's $2,500. <laughs> Just in case. She's going to pull the calculator up. Okay, so, so yeah, $1,500 car, $1,000 gearbox. Um, and, and for $1,000, you could probably get it with the front half of the drive shaft. You need to swap it over. Maybe. Right? Maybe. And then 200 bucks for axle stub shafts, um, 400 bucks for axles, uh, and that's just to handle the drive. Oh, also clutch and flywheel because you need a 240 mil. So you can buy a cheap one of those off eBay for about 240 bucks. And what are we at? 3340. So you're now your $1,500 car is $3,340. And you've spent 40 hours plus 
finding the parts, going and getting the parts, and installing the parts. So you could have just bought a 328 that has all that already and probably worked. And probably you're going to do this and then realize there's something else wrong and it's going to spiral into this whole thing where you should have just bought a 328. And then you're going to want to swap a 328 motor in. Oh, and, and you have less o- power. And it's going to be OBD1 instead of OBD2. And you have less power. I don't know if that matters, but... No, that's power. right. E46 is the exact same math. You buy a 323 or 325, and then you buy a $1,000 gearbox, a couple hundred, maybe... I mean, includes, that probably includes a drive shaft, like we said. And then stub shafts, axles, everything. I don't know. When I had to buy a gearbox, it did not come with... Right, but you got a better deal than that, though. I know, but it was a pain in the butt to find one. The drive shaft's hard to find, but Dorman, luckily, now you can just buy the drive Mm -hmm. shaft, which is nice, and it comes with better U-joints and everything already. But yeah, so it's really not worth it. And then 318's even more, because you got to swap the diff and all that stuff, too, and you're even more. So even if you bought a 318 for $1,000 that was running and driving... Still doesn't make sense. 40 hours of labor and $2,000 later, just to get where your 328 would have been that you bought, and you just... Went and drove it. Mm-hmm. My E36 M3 has 298,000 miles on it. Runs like a top. Best E36 M3 I own. Duh. So the drivetrain in the E36s is so robust. Like, it is insane. Like, we have a school car that... Pro- the black M3. Black sedan. 355,000? 397,000. Oh, my bad. It's almost 400,000 miles. It's the original motor, the original transmission, the original, actually not the diff, because we swapped the diff ratio. Mm-hmm. But this car, and I cannot stress you enough, has done 20 years of drifting. Not because we've had it for 20 years, but because that car probably has 5,000 laps at park. Yeah. At least 5,000. Now, typically, when you go to a park day or a track day, you get 25 or 30 laps. Let's just say you get 50. That means that that car has gone a hundred days of drifting on the original stuff, and it started with three hundred and ninety thousand miles. Like, I'm pretty sure last I checked, it had like thirty four or thirty five hundred miles, and it doesn't leave the track. It's only been drifted mm-hmm. there, and it's the original. It burns no oil. Yep. And none of the cars burn oil. The only cars that burn oil are like the S fifty cars because. At some point, we burnt a valve or messed something up, like, in terms of, like, because they have problems with them. And they burn a little bit of oil. Like, a whole track day would be, like, a cap full of oil. Like, I would do probably 10 school days, and it would be down a quart. Yeah. Which is, like, I don't know, 300 laps. 275 laps. Miles don't matter. Yeah, the miles don't matter, basically, is what I'm saying. Like, it's way better to have something that has been maintained and people have been taken care of and that doesn't make noises and doesn't do any of that. And the motor and transmission and rear end and stuff, they're just bomb proof. Like, it's, Mm -hmm. you know, and another thing to look at, too, is when you're doing this is like axles and all that. There's a lot of crappy replacement axles. You want to make sure you're trying to put OEM stuff back in there because the OEM stuff is way stronger than like part shop stuff. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the mileage, it doesn't matter. And that's kind of one of the beauties of these cars is they hold 700 horsepower for the motor, trans, and diff, and all that stuff. So they'll live forever with 220. Yeah. It's crazy. Even 320. Even 320. Even 420. Blaze it. I'm out. So moving on to E46s, they're not as good as E36s, sorry. (laughs) Here's the reasons why, though. An E36, like, realistically, you can go to the track 100% stock and shred them and never really have a problem. The E46s have a lot more little problems um, when you build them. Um, So E46, just moving on, sticking on the E46 aspect... There is a similar mentality to the E36. Buying one that's not a 328, 330, which is available in E46, or M3, um, it just isn't good if you're going to plan on drifting and and taking it somewhat seriously. The reason being is 323, 325, again, very uh, glass gearbox, not very strong. Again, with the axles and everything, very weak. 
the diffs on all the E46s are the same. Um, not the same ratio, but they are the same. But the output shafts and actual uh, dr uh, axles themselves are, are weaker. Um, so it's much better to go 328 for A, the power, and for the strength. And then it's probably best to just buy a 330. Given that you can buy a 323 or 325 for 2500 to 3500 bucks. E46s are actually cheaper than E36s now. I wonder um, why. Yeah. The 330 is really king. And the 330 is kind of like a hidden sleeper for mm -hmm. that. Because the 330 makes very similar power to even, or feels like it makes similar power to even the E36 M3. Because it's got lots of torque. Because the difference between the two is like E46, all the engines are dual Vanos which means mm. both cam, intake and exhaust cams can move to adjust timing. So you end up with this really flat power band that will dig a little more down low, but doesn't quite have as much up top as some of the uh, E36 motors, but it's pretty good. Um, but yeah, again, kind of staying away from 323, 325, just because again, the upgrade cost of the car when you want to go drift it for real gets really expensive 323 325 doesn't really have a lot of tuning options the transmission axles all that stuff is really weak the big thing about the e46 is pretty much right off the bat you're going to have to drop the whole entire rear subframe out now if you're building a drift car you're probably going to weld the diff and do that kind of stuff anyway so you might be halfway there pulling the diff out but the rear subframe straight rip right out of the floor of these cars and if it hasn't been done already, it's probably an 80% chance that there's some sort of cracks and damage there that are gonna start to show face outside of the visible bushing area very quickly once you start drifting. So subframes gotta be dropped out of the car, cracks have to be fixed, plates have to be welded in from the bottom and the top through the floor of the car, and then the subframe needs to be reinstalled. While you're doing that, you should definitely put some aggressive bushings in the differential uh, or in the subframe itself, but then leave the differential ones new OEM because you want movement in the diff to save the rest of the subframe stuff. It acts like a little cushion to everything. Um, that's always my take is like solid everything that or, or hard mounted everything that is a suspension related item. And then the drivetrain should always kind of be soft to have some sort of cushion to save it all when you're beating the crap out of it. But if you don't do that work yourself with the subframe, that's a $1,500 to $2,000 deal right off the bat with an E46. So the money you've saved going E46, you're right back in it. You could have bought an E36. But if you like E46 better, it's fine. It's just something you're going to have to do. Now, there are people that drift without it. They say it doesn't crack or whatever. Again, that's cool. I'm just telling you because if you drive halfway across the country to go drive some track and your subframe's already cracked, but you can't really see it because the bushings are blocking it, and you start drifting it for a three-day weekend and your subframe starts falling out, you're done for the weekend, and you've spent $2,000 to be there for the weekend, and you're about to leave your subframe at turn three, the whole thing just fall out. Yeah, so you gotta you gotta do that. That's an additional cost. Some of the uh, the differences with the E46 is throughout the years are the 330 got a six speed. I think in 04, so 04, 05, and 06. It might be 05 and 06 only. 04, 05, and 06. All 330s are six speeds, and that gearbox is strong and good too. Um, and you get an overdrive gear, which you don't ever really matter for drifting, but it's different. They also came with a better rear end ratio, those models. It's really easy to find the diff ratios online if you just Google them, but E46 came with 293, 307, 315, 338, 346, and 364. Um, for the power range that the E46 has and the power band that it has, the 364 pretty much works best for almost all tracks. There are some tracks that maybe have some slow turns and fast turns that a 320 or 315 or 338 would be better and you just leave it in second. But the problem is with the 315 is like, if you get into an even slower turn, you don't have a middle gear. So I always try to run the three sixes in, in um, all the E46s. Um, like I said, they're dual Venus. Like Chelsea said, they're all aluminum block. Um, so one of the big things with the E46s is you cannot overheat them. 
Like an E36, you can get away with getting them pretty hot. The heads can crack and they can have some problems, but it, but you can always fix them. The E46, if you overheat it bad, you need a whole new motor because the block is aluminum and they have a liner inside of it that wears out and basically it trashes the whole motor when you get them hot. So again, clutch fan or leave the factory E fan that comes with some of the E46s. I don't know exactly how the models work with those, but I think some of the autos got one and manuals got the other, but you can interchange either of them. I'd put the clutch fan on all of them. Um, because if you overheat that motor, it's done. It just basically loses compression and trashes itself. They do run cooler, and they are easier to keep cool, but when you overheat them, it's it's a mess. Um, the better part about the aluminum block is it's lighter. Um, it's like about 60 pounds lighter, and like I said with a dual Vanos, you have a much flatter power band. It makes more torque, and it ramps the horsepower in a lot nicer. The power levels between it, 323, 325, make about the same as a 325 E36 motor, just a little more torque. I think they make right at about 160-ish wheel um, for a 325. A 328 is like right at about 180 wheel. 330 is a little over 200 wheel. And uh, they all benefit a ton from headers because the emission stuff is in the header. So if you're going to the track and racing only, you can put headers on and pick up almost 20 wheel off headers uh, alone. And they run much cooler that way. So E46, cost effectiveness, they are cheaper up front, um, but they're definitely more in the long run because of the subframe modifications and some of the other things you need to do. Some of the positives, like I said, are the motor has a lot of torque. It's a little bit lighter. Um, the engine is, so you keep more weight off the front. It is a newer car. The chassis is much stiffer. Um, <clears throat> and just overall, uh, parts availability, it's a little bit cheaper to own those cars versus E36. You agree? So comparing the two, E36 and E46, uh, E36, no matter what you do, however you build it, it's always going to be lighter than an E46, but an E46 is always going to be stiffer everywhere except the subframe. So there's about an 80 to 120 pound differential if you build the cars identically the same. So like right out of the box, the E46 is like I think 150-ish pounds heavier than the E36. But as you build them into a drift car, they usually have between 80 and 120 pounds difference between the two. I've built the lightest E36 I could possibly build as a drift car with a turbo M52, and it was right at about 2450 without me in it. And when I built the lightest E46 I possibly could, even later, knowing more and having better education and a little bit more budget, I was able to build one down to 2560 with the same engine in it. So like I said, it's about 100-ish pounds difference. Um, Parts and availability on the E36, you can still buy all the stuff brand new, but used parts getting harder and more expensive to find. Mm -hmm. E46s are easier at this point, but in the near future, they might be even harder to get parts. Who knows? Or maybe not. Or maybe not, because you should just buy E36 328. <laughs> Anyways, the point of this video was basically to explain how to buy an E36 E46, what to buy and what to basically prepare yourself for outside of the normal drift car stuff, you know? So no matter how you look at it, there's lots of different ratios, lots of different ways to build it, lots of different parts that you can put together. You can build a car out of anything you want, but if you're going to buy a car that basically you want to start off with something that you can shred and have a better outlook on what the possibilities are, 328, 330, or M3 between all of them. Something also worth noting with the E46 is they made a ZHP model, and that is the badass model that's non-M basically. Um, that comes with bigger cams and a couple other little things and the six speed throughout the whole suite. Also had a different aero kit and all that too. Those are also getting pretty expensive now though. Yeah. You had a white one. I did, I had a white with Alcantara interior. <sighs> so nice. Yeah, so I don't hate E46s completely. There's just some that look better than others. Yeah, I mean, I think just the same. Like, if they had a ZHP version of an E36, mm -hmm. it'd be the same thing. There would be some cool things like the GTS style and all yeah. that stuff. So, yeah, the E46 ZHP would be king of the hill outside of the M3 itself. And then the M3 um, is pretty much the baddest shit. Yeah. Like, you can't touch it. Like, there's no E36 that's even close to it in terms of drivability and, and, and the strength. 
the gearbox diff axles and all of that is so strong in the E46 that like 700 horsepower drift cars can run it. There's many people that swap, especially overseas, swap the 210 mil diff setup into Nissans and all sorts of different cars because they're yeah. like the diff stronger than even GTR diffs. Mm. Also, the E46 M3 subframe with all the diff and axles and brakes and everything that's super strong fits in every E46. Just bolts right in. Everything's exactly the same. Um, you just have to change the drive shaft, which there's plenty of options for that now too. Um, so basically, that indestructible diff that comes in limited slip, um, the axles, everything just bam right in a 323 will even fit right up. Um, the gearbox indestructible, dude. Like even stronger than the ZF by far. It's rated at another 100 foot pounds higher from the factory. So. I mean, that's like a common upgrade for the eight, 900 horsepower guys. Mm -hmm. So the M3 is obviously the baddest of the baddest, but they're not cheap anymore. The cheapest E46 manual M3s you can buy are like 14, 15 grand now, and they're probably rebuilt title and pretty thrashed. Now, the engine, S54, is sick. It's 3.2 liters and makes 330 horsepower stock. So it's like a, over 100 horsepower per liter. Stock, they rev to like 8,000 RPM, 7,800, super high. And with simple bolt-ons, they can make crazy power. So like a stock E46 M3 on the dyno at the tire will make like 280-ish. And like my E46 is completely stock. It just has like a head gasket and some other things because I overheated it one time. Or maybe that was you. I can't even remember. I think it was you. You were just driving it home. Oh, I was driving it home for you, yeah. Yeah. You had put a piece of I cardboard. I put a piece of cardboard over the radiator. And our so thing that, didn't work. Yeah, so that would heat up. So Don't she would have me. heat because it was snowing. And I thought I blew the head gasket. So I took the head off and redid everything and didn't find anything wrong with it. Mm -hmm. Turns out the water pump broke a couple impeller wheels off. Yeah. And I did a whole head job on it and everything for no reason. But... Now I know it's solid and good. <laughs> but yeah, so that car is 100% stock, oil pan to valve cover outside of just a head gasket job. Rod but bearings. I use a, oh, And rod bearings. We're getting there. Uh. Um, and that car makes 350 wheel. So it's like 70 horsepower more just from bolt-on. So airbox, uh, exhaust, standalone computer. But you could have probably done that much power with a stock computer and a really good header and exhaust. And it picked up almost 70 wheel which is like sick that's crazy you know like obviously the parts are expensive for s54 but yeah like i think it's a 550 dollar header or something and then the air box is like 1500 it's crazy but the air box is like only worth like eight to ten horsepower it's just sick looking it sounds cool yeah um but e46 m3 is Obviously, king of the hill, but the cost. I mean, you can buy a 330 that's like a drift car that's like runs and drives good that might just be a little beat up for four to five grand all day when an E46 M3 is 15 grand for a equally clapped out car. I feel like they're coming back down a little bit. Everything's nah. just. I just saw one. It was kind of nice. It was like, While I'm finishing this, find me an E46 M3 that's less than 15 done. grand. That's six speed manual, not SMG. Okay. Also, the trick with the SMG, if you're watching, now that we're deep in the video, I can give away some secrets here. You can actually not even remove the gearbox from the car and swap it over to a full manual car because the SMG is, is actually manual. It just completely does the clutch movement and shifting electronically. So you remove that whole unit, put a regular slave in it, um, and put a shifter that has a detent built in. So you have to buy one that has detent built in. So like IRP and a couple other options. And you can literally not take anything off of it and convert it to a manual by putting a clutch pedal line and all the little stuff in it. Okay, well, if that's the case, you can buy SMG ones for 10 grand. Yeah, but I'm saying a manual one. No, I know. Give me a second. I want to see an SMG one that's not a convertible for oh. 18 no, no, grand. No, 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 sorry. Oh. Sorry. That's 10 time. grand. Okay, it's that's SMG. good. Selling as is. Has a small dent from hitting a deer. Hmm. Well, engine runs good, but needs some work done to the body and rear end. Okay, so the subframe's probably ripping out of it. But that's okay, because hey. you're going to have to do that no matter what. If it's not really bad, that's a good deal. But still, 
we're talking more yeah. than twice the price of a 330 to have 100 more horsepower and all the badass differential stuff and we'll gearbox. find one before. She is really good at finding stuff. Anyway, so obviously E46 M3, King of the Hill. Then E36 M3 is right behind that. Um, all of those motors and all that stuff swap between cars pretty easily, pretty simply. So you could even build out an E36 with an S54 for very little labor effort at least. Um, and that's kind of the beauty about being able to swap all this stuff around and un understanding it. There's lots of groups and lots of information out there. But E46 M3, King of the Hill, E36 M3 is next. And then probably 328. And then 3 liter M3 E36. Where are you putting the 330? Next. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then E46 330, E46 328. And then the rest is kind of... To me, a waste of time, money, and effort in the long run if you're going to drift it for real. If you're just looking for a car to thrash around and do whatever, that's a different story. But <sighs> that was a lot of information. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hopefully you took some notes. I don't know. I feel like I just gave you the recipe for just buying a 328 is the way to go or a 330. Also, if you want to buy my white E36 M3, let me know. Yeah, that's really, really nice, though. That's Probably really, don't really want to nice. build a drift car. Not a drift that. car. I'd be really disappointed if somebody bought that and turned it into a drift car. Hey, man, do what you want. Yeah. Do what you want. Your money is the same your no matter what you're going to do. <laughs> I didn't mean it like that. Uh -huh, Carl, Carl sure. did cool things. Okay. Carl will do cool things. All right, so in the comments, I'm sure I forgot a million things. So let him know. Let me know in the comments because that's going to help everybody else watch this. You know, I'm sure there's a bunch of details I left out, but the goal of this was just to explain why you shouldn't buy a 318, 323, 325, and you should buy one of the higher level cars for a similar price just because you don't have to do the labor and all the efforts 